Okay. Welcome to Inside the Lab. This is a forum with a group of some of our technical experts here at Phenomenex. So this week's subject is sample prep and filtration. We have a panel with Walid, Kevin, and Carissa. I'm Sandra, and I'll be the moderator. I work on the product marketing team. Walid, would you like to start off and introduce yourself? Of course. Thanks, Sandra. So my name is Walid Afak, and I am an associate uh, application scientist for our applications lab over here at Phenomenex. I've been with the company for a little over two years, two and a quarter years now, and my main focus is doing the chiral screens, chiral work for the applications lab, as well as some small molecule analysis and method development. Kevin? Oh, Kevin, you're on mute. You're muted, Kevin. <laughs> That's a good start. Yeah, so my name is Kevin Luke. <laughs> Um, I'm part of our technical team here at Phenomenex. Um, I've been here five years, just a little, little over five years now. Um, yeah, and uh, our team is the team that you'll see handling our technical support on our web chat function. Uh, if you're submitting technical support requests through the website, um, yeah, you'll probably hit one of us. Uh, we're the ones handling most of your, your technical support questions over here. And last but not least, Carissa. Oh, Carissa, you're also on mute. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Carissa. Uh, I am in sales here over at Phenomenex. I handle mostly forensic and Department of Health accounts here, as well as the CDC. I've been with the company for four and a half years now, and I am very excited about today's topic. So now that you've all met our panel, let's start off with some questions. So uh, let's see. Why don't we start off with why is sample filtration important? Yeah, so sample filtration is very important in the lab setting because it protects your sample from any particular matter, allows for clean analysis, clean baselines, and it protects your column and system from damage in particulars as well as contaminants, which can lead to shorter column lifetime, high back pressures, and increased system downtime, which is you know the bane of all laboratories existence. Yeah, definitely. And unless you're like literally using um, one of those monolithic columns, um, it is very, very easy to kill a column very quick uh, if you have a particular heavy sample. Um, very, very quick. And uh, you, depending on your position in the lab, it, it's <laughs> somebody might be yelling at you for that very, <laughs> very loudly. Um, yeah. yeah, some of those columns are not cheap, so protecting your column lifetime is pretty important, not just uh, in terms of column lifetime, but also in terms of financials, if that's something that's, you know, important to your lab to save some money. Yeah, and a guard column alone is not enough to protect protect your column from, from particulate contamination, right? Like, you'll be clogging up your cartridges pretty instantly, again, if you have one of these um, dirty, especially dirt, dirty samples. Um, yeah, and... Uh, you can try, you know, if this happens to you, you can try to, to, to back flush your column to, to save it, uh, but oftentimes uh, it, it can be a pretty quick killer, so. Would you be able to expand more on like, I guess, how, you know, it goes into affecting the column lifetime? Like in your experience, what have you seen like on a column that has not um, filtered its samples versus it has like how, what, what's the difference in how long it has lasted? So I, for I, some, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I have customers who will um, maybe start off doing method development without doing a sample filtration. They just start off with reference materials, so it's very clean. And then they'll move on to actual uh, sample analysis, whether that's evidence in a crime lab or um, environmental samples from a public health lab or or uh, things like that, and they kind of forget that that important step of of sample prep, sample filtration beforehand, and the column, instead of lasting, you know, thousand injections, all of a sudden is lasting thirty, and that is a dramatic decrease in column lifetime. And um, and then if if you don't have another column on hand, your analysis is at a at a dead stop. So it's Pretty important to remember to include when doing method development uh, to also include in your development phase uh, development for a sample 
preparation, sample filtration. Yeah, and it can be very obvious, right? Like uh, if your pressure starts spiking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but if uh, maybe your sample is a little bit on the cleaner side, but still has some particulates in it, um, something, some signs of, of your column clogging over time uh, is not only the pressure going up, um, but you can see if that front foot, of front, front foot of your column starts getting clogged up, uh, your peak shape is also going to start going off as well, right? You can start seeing some tailing um, uh, as well as that high pressure. So uh, it can exactly, and and that high pressure may also include uh, add on to a baseline drift. Which if you start seeing baseline drift uh, pretty stagnant, then you're going to have unreliable data over time because the retention of your sample will have shifted as well and you'll start seeing additional impurities impurity peaks and it's just an overall bad time for uh, data sets definitely all good points oh was there anything else to add wasn't sure if i saw someone okay so would you say like when working with nano systems is it like much more important to filter before your analysis because there is smaller ids and whatnot Um, I, I would definitely say uh, yes, and I would speak to two things on that, uh, is that nano columns you'll typically see with smaller particle sizes as well. Um, so it's important that you choose your, your pore size for your membrane um, appropriately, right? So uh, columns with particle size um, 3 micron and smaller, which is typical for nano columns, uh, you want to make sure you're using a 0.2 micron filter um, just because uh, the interstitial space between those smaller particle sizes is going to be smaller. Right, so they're easier to clog with smaller particles. Um, so important to choose a smaller pore size for those. Uh, and again, because yeah, those IDs are smaller, there's not a lot of interstitial space to work. You're working with in the first place. Uh, so they, if you have even a little bit of particulate, uh, you can clog those up fairly quickly. So now that we've got a rundown of why sample filtration is important, why don't we delve into some of the products? So some people may not be familiar with this product and some are. Um, so how would you explain what is a filter vial and maybe how does it also work? I, I can answer that. Uh, filter vial is uh, similar in function, I guess, to a syringe filter. Uh, except it's in a vial form. So you have an outer vial like shell and an inner filtration. And all you have to do is load your sample, compact the inner vial and the outer vial to force the sample through the filter. And then you're done. That's like <laughs> how easy it is. Um, you, you've got your filtered uh, sample and it's already in the vial. Just load it on the instrument and run. It's uh, super easy. Yeah, yes. and you brought up a good point uh, also that is just a quick plug and play. These uh, filter vials are the standard uh, vial size of 12 by 33 uh, millimeters. So you don't have to uh, transfer them over to a typical amber vial or not. Their uh, faded coating actually helps protect from uh, some light, not all of it, but some light. And you should just be able to plug and play. Yeah, the reduction of those transfer steps is definitely a huge time saver. Yeah, uh, I've definitely been been uh, looking forward to working with these myself. Um, also, add if any of you have ever done stockroom management, uh, it's <laughs> definitely yep. uh, convenience not to have to order those extra parts or have say you have your separate syringe filters, separate vials, and one of those is out of stock or so, or your vendor can't supply them. It's always a pain in the butt when you find that out, uh, you know, late in your your analysis. Uh, that you're running low on something. Um, so easier to have, uh, you know, just everything together, easier to, to keep track of your stock, make sure you're or easier to, to refill your orders when you need to as well. So definitely a convenience factor there. Definitely. So it sounds like stock management is a good, uh, big benefit of filter vials to Kevin. So I was wondering, Chris and Wally, what are some other benefits of filter vials? Uh, well, the time save is huge. Um, I think also for those uh, in the lab who aren't used to filtering, aren't used to doing sample prep, um, just having a all-in-one solution, a filter and a vial in one is probably going to just take their analysis to the next level, right? Their sample is going to be cleaner. They're going to have longer column lifetimes and um, just having that 
time save on top of a monetary save, right? Like Kevin mentioned, you're not buying syringe filters, uh, disposable syringes and vials. You're just buying a, a pack of, you know, these filtration vials. It's it's an all in one safe time bunny space. <laughs> Yeah, on top of the time and money save, you also notice in the lab that there's less clutter, less waste uh, management mm -hmm. because it's just one uh, part. It's the plunger and the uh, reservoir, whereas you won't need to uh, have a needle, a uh, syringe, syringe filter, extra vial for transfer, pipettes. It's just a nice overall laboratory management and clean uh, tabletops uh, solution. Yeah. Yeah, and kind of delving into that a bit more about the potential waste or the many different products with the traditional sample um, filtration setup. Is lab waste, you think, something that's taken into consideration nowadays? Nowadays, at least with our applications lab, we are starting to uh, be a bit more wary with our waste uh, management just because you don't want to have so many uh, like glass vials just in the trash. You don't want to keep filling up your drum, especially if you're limited to one, one drum like we are. You want to kind of like manage it as well as possible to not overflow it for uh, the waste management to come in. Just just overall less pollution as well. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've definitely been in a lot of labs where they don't know what's in their drawers, right? <laughs> you might have some, some, like, just your vial over here in some drawer in the back. You have your caps over here in some other <laughs> drawer somewhere else, and then you, mm -hmm. you don't even know what you're ordering. You have all the stuff that goes to waste. Uh, it, it it happens all the time, and it, and uh, definitely this is something that could help with that. Yeah, and I think as, as uh, we as a society move towards more green measures, right, more environmentally friendly measures, having less waste, less physical waste and then also less plastic glass waste is really important and, and becomes more important, especially for those companies where they are looking to greener initiatives. This would be a good solution for them. A very good point. And so if a user is using, you know, a traditional syringe filtration method or that setup, how would you explain the transition or switch from that to filter vials? either in terms of like is it difficult is it easy like is it something they need to like you know takes a little bit to pick up um probably no time at all to pick up actually um it's a lot easier uh, the function is similar to a syringe filter in that you're pushing a sample through a filter. Um, so as long as you remember that and keep that in mind uh, when you load your sample and then um, put the internal plunger, you know, into the vial and snap, there you go. And then instead of pipetting into a new vial and putting that onto the instrument, you're you're just ready to go, right? So I, I would say it'd be a lot easier to transition from that traditional filtration to a filter vial. Yeah, I, I don't imagine it would take you more than a few. <laughs> right. Around with the filter vials yeah. To complete move yeah no i agree and really what you're going to get used to is uh, the amount of pressure that you need to click the the filter in place and it's not a lot of pressure um you know obviously it's you could do it with your finger but it's um that would probably be the most difficult thing to adjust to mm -hmm. yeah so kind of like Waleed, what we'll lead was saying earlier it's a little bit of plug and play Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's talk about the actual membranes a little bit. Um, do you commonly see a type of me filter membrane used more often in certain industries or with certain industries? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, yeah, d d different industries definitely favor different types of membranes. Um, I would start with food and environmental. I would say sort of glass fiber and, and nylon membrane combos are just very common because those sample types are commonly very particulate heavy. Uh, so I like, like to have that um, pre-filter glass fiber in front of those uh, to help catch those particulate to prevent it from clogging the, the nylon membrane. Um, so that's pretty common for, for food and environmental. Um, I know, Krista, do you want to mention what you usually see over in forensics and talks? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it 
it depends on um you know whether they're doing something that's like an aqueous mixture or more solvent based so if it's solvent like hexanes they're going to go with something hydrophobic um pes probably uh, would be the most common uh, especially if it's post-mortem or blood or urine or something like that where you have um uh, larger proteins and and lipids and stuff that you want to filter out um and if you're going with an aqueous solvent mixture that's uh, hydrophilic, you're going to want to go with nylon or regenerated cellulose. Um, those are a lot easier to use. And then um, again, most of forensic based will go with a larger um, pore size on the filters just because they do have larger molecules and you don't want to clog the filter up before you get a chance to get the rest of the sample through. Um, and uh, I think with Department of Health Labs, kind of like what Kevin mentioned, you're going to go with with nylon is a good overall um, broad uh, general filter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And, oh, sorry, and if you want to, yeah, sorry about that, Kevin. But if you want to uh, like filter out like tissue cultures, then uh, PES, the polyether sulfone, uh, membrane will be like good for you it's it's a very uh porous membrane it's very simple to uh just pass through and if you're doing more protein analysis work or uh straight biological samples then you have the choice between uh the pes polyether sulfone or the pvdf the polyvinyl vinylidine uh fluoride uh membrane so you're not constricted to just one membrane per Example, uh, typically what I found in the lab is that you have a wide variety available to you. Uh, the only difference that you'll mainly see is just how much pressure you would really need to just press down on it and just make sure that you don't over uh, do the pressure to burst the membrane. Yeah, I, I also want to emphasize on that point, uh, like what we were saying, uh, those the PES, PVDF, and also cellulose acetate as, as low protein binding membranes for your biological samples, your protein samples. Um, those are really important. Um, but it's also really important to note because we, we were talking about nylon membranes. Uh, nylon is in fact a very high protein binding membrane, right? So you want to avoid nylon um, for those biological uh, types of applications. Um, yeah, so they're very, very important to, to note those. Um, uh, the other industry I wanted to mention because I, I mentioned environmental earlier, uh, is while it's common to use those glass fiber and, and nylon membranes, um, for certain applications, uh, those are also not appropriate, right? So PFAS analysis uh, is a very, very big deal, right? Um, so for PFAS, uh, those are, it's probably one of the trickier um, analysis that you do, especially for these environmental labs, uh, because those long chain PFASs, uh, it's really easy to lose recovery of them uh, through your filter membrane, actually. Um, so nylon, very high binding, um, high, it's a more hydrophobic membrane, right? So high binding for, for not only proteins, but also for stuff like PFAS, right? So nylon, you can lose a lot of your recovery. Um, regenerated cellulose is actually not bad, uh, but you still do lose some. Uh, the best one, again, for, for PFAS, for these long chain PFAS uh, for recovery is also PES. Uh, That's another one for PFAS. Um, if you're in sort of, if you're in, in aqueous or sort of uh, high aqueous mix um, uh, solvent, uh, PES is best, uh, but if you're in some like uh, organic solvent, uh, polypropylene is also pretty good. Uh, so that's just one, something I wanted to mention for PFAS because it is sort of uh, different out of the norm for these environmental samples. Yeah, you mentioned um, RC. Um, that's usually regarded as a good general purpose filter for most applications. So what about it makes it a good general purpose filter? Um, I would say it's because it has just very low, low binding, low association with most types of, of, of compounds. Um, that's probably the, the biggest deal. Uh, actually, has pretty good solvent compatibility all around as well. Uh, so regenerated cells is pretty good all around. Uh, what do you guys think? No, I agree. Yeah, I agree. it's also low protein. Nothing more to really add. Yeah, it's also fairly low protein binding, so also a good option there. Yeah, um, definitely. The, oh. Oh, just one last thing I wanted to mention um, before I forget uh, the top of my head uh, for um, for IC work. So, so iron chromatography, uh, ICP, um, if you're doing like trace metal analysis, uh, PES is also a great one for that industry because it's uh, the lowest extractables for, for trace metals. 
Uh, so that's a good one to keep to, to keep in mind. Uh, something I learned recently, so I wanted to share. <laughs> that's good to know. Yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even know that at this point. <laughs> yeah, no, I I just learned that uh, last week. So <laughs> <laughs> learning something new every day. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so we covered filter files um, a good amount. So why don't we talk about what are some other filtration options? Okay, uh, so we're just talking about like a sort of a standard syringe filter. Yeah, yeah, or just like, yeah, what other options out there? And that is definitely one of them. So let's talk about that. Yeah, I would say one of the, the reasons that you would still go to a standard syringe filter over a filter vial these days uh, is if you do have a very high volume to filter, all right? It's easier to use something, uh, a large diameter uh, syringe filter membrane um, over, over a filter vial. That's why probably one of the main benefits why, why you would still go back to, to an old style like that. Yeah, also uh, if you have a different uh, volume that you're going to use, right? You've got a, a limited uh, volume on filter vials. I want to say it's almost half a mil, um, but if you're, fil yeah. So if you're filtering something that's, uh, let's say three to five mils, you're going to want to go with a traditional syringe filter and uh, lure lock syringe for that type of application. Yeah, and if maybe if there's a membrane that's available as a, as a standard syringe filter and that's not available through your filter vial, um, that'd be another reason to stick with the standard syringe filter. Yeah, and the what's really neat is uh, with these filter vials, right, we have a wide variety of options. So we have size options for each filter membrane type, regenerated cellulose, nylon, PES, um, PTFE, but what is uh, really cool is all those same options are available in our syringe filters too. So if you're interested in the filtration vials, but that's not something that your lab can do, um, just let us know, let your salesperson know, because we also have uh, our Fenix um, syringe uh, filters and plastic uh, syringes, disposable syringes for you to use as well. Yeah, and then uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but do are the glass fiber combo filters available in a filter vial? The glass combo? No, not currently. Yeah, so if you do have a very particulate heavy sample um, and you do want to have that glass fiber pre-filter, um, you know, those are more available in, in these syringe filter options. Um, just going to help prevent that, help prevent your, um, your actual filter membrane from clogging up if you put that glass fiber pre-filter in front. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and with this, you know, the syringe filter um, filtration method, there's a couple more moving pieces. So would you say there is a proper syringe filter technique? Uh, yes. Um, so this is something that uh, I don't get, don't get to talk a lot about, but it depends on, on your lab and how you, how you might have been trained to start with. Um, but what I see as the proper technique is to uh, draw a little bit of, of air into your syringe uh, before you drop your sample. Uh, that way, when you're uh, pushing your sample through the filter, that little bit of air that you put uh, that you pulled up in the first place can help purge your syringe filter uh, of any remaining sample that would have remained in the filter, right? So if you're working with something that's uh, a very limited volume sample, right? Um, maybe it's a patient sample or something, and you want you don't want to make sure you don't lose anything to that residual volume uh, of the syringe filter. That air purge can help uh, a lot with your recovery. Um, so that's really important. Um, and then if you are again working with one of those um, analysis that's like maybe very um, high sensitivity or if you just have very low concentrations of your sample uh, and you do find that your filter has some sort of, of leachate or extractable that's interfering with your analysis, uh, you can also do a wash of your filter before you use it too, but somehow that's coming into play, right? So you can wash with uh, some sort of ultra pure water or maybe water and a little bit of acid uh, and you can do this a couple times to your filter uh and you can get rid of those any extractables that might be getting your way uh before you before you run with the filter so uh that's also something that uh, you should keep in your mind if you run into those issues carissa and wally do you what do you think of what kevin says the proper syringe filter technique is yeah no and he brought up a good point about washing it before especially if you have a uh, low level um analytes that you're looking to recover and um you don't want any leachables either to to show up 
in your chromatogram or, or that might show up at the same time, right? And, and kind of disrupt your chromatography. It, it's a good idea to wash it beforehand. Um, I, that very interesting um, to know about a little bit of acid in water. I was always um, kind of told if you do have that, uh, rinse it with the same uh, solvent that you're using um, first to get out whatever leachables and then put your sample with the solvent through it and and do it that way. But that is good information, Kevin. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and I'm very glad that Kevin brought up uh, bringing in a little bit of air before uh, bringing your sample because you don't, especially if you have a very limited amount of sample, you want to maximize as much as you can and you don't want any of that sample being left remaining in the uh, syringe filter for you to just never be able to get again. So I'm very happy that you brought that yeah. up. That, that, yeah. that is a mistake I have made prior before. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, but in, in the opposite case, if you do have very high volume, right, if you do have a high, very high volume of sample, maybe you're not as afraid of losing anything uh, to that residual volume. Um, instead of a wash, you can just sort of get rid of the first maybe half a mil that you're pushing through uh, to help push out any extractables or leachables in your mm -hmm. as well. Um, so, yeah, in the opposite case. So it looks like we're nearing time, but before we close off, I wanted to ask y'all um, in regards to this one, um, or this filtration option, or even the ones we previously talked about, do you have any tips to go about it? Like filtration in general? Yes, filter uh, is very <laughs> important, filtering. Uh, for those of you who aren't currently doing that, um, I highly recommend you jump on and, and start filtering your samples, whether that's with the filtration vial or your syringe filter. Making sure you have a clean sample isn't just good for your calm lifetime, but also your chromatography, right? The less interference, the less background you have, um, the, the better your chromatography is going to look, but also the better your results are going to be, right? You don't want to clog up, especially if you have, let's say, a mass spec um, on your back end. You want to minimize the amount of stuff that's going to be um, put onto the ion source, right? The less amount of instrument downtime you have, <laughs> the better, right? You don't want to spend all day cleaning your ion source and then and then getting your instrument back online. Um, so just make sure you're, you're, you are cleaning up your sample, you're filtering your sample, and if there's anything that you guys need, reach out to us, right? You're, you can reach out to Kevin, 24 hour chat. You can reach out to your salesperson. We also have Waleed in our applications lab. And if if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask. That's what we're here for. We want to help you. Yeah, I, I yeah. agree with Carissa. M my main tip is reach out to your sales rep uh, if you don't know what to start with, right? Because there are a lot of membrane types uh, and multiple, there's multiple, a lot of options. And if you don't know what to start with, reach out to your sales rep. They can, they can just sample you uh, multiple different types of membranes to try out to see what works best for you. Uh, and for me, that's just the easiest way to find out what works. So, a hundred percent agree. Agreed. And also on top of that, we do have brochures available that uh, outline the differences between the different uh, filter membranes, so that you can have an easy choice should you not have enough time to contact your sales rep or. Your or sales rep is say out of the office for the week, then you still have options to get uh, the necessary information you require. Definitely. So sounds like a lot of good tips and a lot of good info from our panel. So just want to say a huge thank you to Waleed, Kevin, and Carissa. And thank you for watching. Um, this is another episode of Inside the Lab, and I hope you stay tuned for the next one to get lots of more information. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>